this event is part of the celebration of 125 years uh, since the uh, original building, the one to the north of us, up north of this new gym, uh, has been built. So all year along, we are celebrating 125 years. And so, so the talk is the Bohemian Kings uh, part of this whole event. And uh, Ted Kresa over here is our uh, uh, in-house historian, editor of our newsletter, uh, and man of many skills. Uh, and he will uh, talk about uh, several things, just to give you example. But the point I want to make is this whole uh, night's jousting and it's like, you think it's some kind of fairy tale thing? No, this is our history. The Bohemian uh, people, which are in the central part of Europe, you probably all know that, I'm probably preaching to the choir. Uh, there were kingdoms and with kings, and the kings employed knights uh, to defend the country, and it was all part of our, our history. So when we came across this opportunity to uh, have the knights do a performance, we thought like, yeah, that makes sense for us, especially this year. So I think Suki is in. Now that Suki is in, I think we can start. We, we can go. Uh, and so with that, uh, I'll uh, hand it over to Ted, who will teach us about Bohemian Kings. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to Soko Greater Cleveland. Thanks for sticking around. Um, I want to ask you to use your imagination for a moment. Can you hear me okay in the back? No. Absolutely. All right, maybe that's a little bit better. Yeah. Uh, so I'd like to ask you to use your imagination just for a moment. So picture, if you will, land covered by forests, woodlands and meadows, and dotted with towns, villages, and working fields. As you ride across the land, you find there are castles and chateaux tucked in everywhere. This is today's Czech Republic. In fact, a small land about two-thirds the size of Ohio has more than 2,000 castles and chateaux. That includes the Prague Castle, which is the largest castle complex in the world, but, but you might ask why are there so many? So we're going to take a short look at Czech history to try to answer that question. Uh, long before there was a Czech Republic, this land belonged to the Kingdom of Bohemia, and from 1002, Bohemia was part of the Holy Roman Empire. The Holy Roman Empire was a political entity, a limited elective monarchy that lasted from 962 until 1806. And it was made up of different territories roughly centered around Germany. Aside from the papacy, the Holy Roman Empire was the most powerful institution in Western Europe in the Middle Ages. Bohemia, an imperial elector was unique in the empire in that it was the only hereditary kingdom. The kingdom of Bohemia was a place of wealth and power. Royals and nobles and aristocratic families built strongholds as residences or to protect their interests. Of course, aristocracy was abolished legally when the independent state of Czechoslovakia was formed in 1918. So these castles and chateaux serve various purposes today. Some are hotels, some are museums, some are private residences. Uh, there are many of them that are popular places uh, for weddings. Uh, I even studied Czech in the castle of Podjebrady one summer, but that's, that's another story. Uh, my topic today is Kings of Bohemia. So that's a huge topic, and, and history records the stories of many, many dukes and kings of Bohemia. Um, but at least now that we've drawn a connection between kings and queens in Czech history, I'm going to highlight just a few. So the first Bohemian ruling house was founded according to legend, and when we start, it's all legend, right? <coughs> according to legend, by the Princess Libusha and the plowman Chemisol, whom she had taken for a husband. This dynasty ruled the Bohemian lands from about 800 to 1306. The rulers of this house were princes or dukes until 1198, when Bohemia became a hereditary kingdom within the Holy Roman Empire. 
course, the best known ruler from the early Premisleds must certainly be the Duke Václav, or you might know him as Wenceslas. His grandfather, Borzhevoy I, was the first historical Chemislid ruler and had been converted to Christianity by St. Methodius. When Václav was 13, his father died and his grandmother, Ludmila, also a Christian, became regent. Václav's mother, Drahumira, was the daughter of a pagan tribal leader and she was jealous of the influence that his grandmother had over Václav, so she had her killed. Drahomira became the new regent and tried to get Václav to abandon his faith, but he held on tight and he actually exiled his mother from Bohemia. He assumed leadership as duke at age 18. Now what you might remember as well about Václav is that he was murdered by his brother, Boleslav the Cruel. I know his name probably should have been the first clue. Uh, on September 28, 935. And he was venerated from that time as a martyr and a saint. He was posthumously given the title king, that's why we know about the king Wenceslas. And he's still considered the patron saint and protector of Bohemia. His grandmother was also made a saint. Now, Václav had built many churches in Bohemia and even founded the rotunda of St. Vitus at the Prague Castle. He promoted Christianity and performed many charitable works. And according to legend, his knights still slumber in the Blahnik Mountain, waiting for the time when they'll emerge behind him to defend the Czech lands in a time of great peril. Now, the period after him was marked by violence and chaos because Bohemia didn't have a law of succession to the throne. Ultimately, the pull to the Holy Roman Empire and to the West won out. Chemisul Odekar I had obtained the title of king for himself and his descendants in 1198, and under him, early medieval Bohemia peaked both economically and politically. His son, Václav, strengthened the kingdom and was even able to keep the Mongols from attacking Bohemia. But the Chemisul dynasty ended in 1306, when his great-grandson, Václav III, um, the last in the male line was assassinated at the Olomouc Castle, a crime that's still a mystery today. Now, our next stop will be with John of Luxembourg, uh, also known as John the Blind. He was the founder of the Bohemian branch of that family. He himself was not of Chemislid, but he was married to Elizabeth of Bohemia, a sister of Václav III. He had come to Prague with an army in December 1310 and took the throne from Henry of Corinthia, who was married to a different sister of Václav III. Well, once established as king and queen of Bohemia, John and Elizabeth lived on the old town square since the Prague castle was considered unlivable. The nobility was leery of John because he was not a Chemislid, he wasn't even a Czech. The Hundred Years' War was on, and John was expected to support his relatives ruling France. He, in effect, left the country largely to be ruled by barons and divided his time between Luxembourg and France. Now, when they were married, John was just 14 and Elizabeth was 18. And it was six years into their marriage when a male heir was born, and they named him Václav. <laughs> The couple had a difficult relationship because of political differences, and in 1319, John discovered a supposed plot to depose him and give the throne to his three-year-old son. Elizabeth was sent to live in the Mjelnik Castle, and the boy was kept in the Krivoklad Castle for four years before being sent to Paris for his education. You may be wondering why we're talking about King John. He was a good diplomat but history, Czech history doesn't even rate him as a, as a good Bohemian king. Still, there are a couple important things. One is his bravery. John was a legendary knight. In 1336, he was fighting Lithuania when he went totally blind, but it didn't stop him. 10 years later, he and his son were asked by the King of France to battle England. John loved to fight, and so they accepted, even though he was completely blind. With his horse tied to the horses of other knights, he rode bravely into battle, and his, his famous words are learned by children in Czech school still. He said, far be it that the king of Bohemia should run away. Instead, take me to the place where the noise of the battle is loudest. 
The Lord will be with us. Nothing to fear. Well, King John the Blind died there in August 1346, together with his knights, and after the battle, their horses were found slain, still tied together. The other reason that we remember John the Blind is that he gave the kingdom of Bohemia and its, its most beloved king of all. His son, Václav, had, at his confirmation, taken the name Charles. We know him as Charles IV, and he presided over Bohemia's golden age. Charles, as I said, was educated in France. One of his teachers was the future Pope Clement VI. The future Pope was a mentor for him and took him to listen to lectures at Sorbonne in Paris. It was like a 10-year-old boy getting a university degree, a unique education. Charles married into the royal family of France and his teacher mentor became the Pope. He was obviously well positioned to become the emperor. He would later be the first Bohemian king to become Holy Roman Emperor. When Charles returned to Prague, the castle was already in terrible condition, unlivable, and there was no money in the coffers to rule Bohemia. Charles redeemed royal castles and towns that had been pawned and rebuilt the kingdom. He could speak five languages and knew the Avignon Pope personally. You get the impression that Maybe Charles was the most educated and powerfully connected person in Central Europe at the time. Unlike his father, the so-called foreigner king, Charles worked to become the father of the homeland. Consider just a few of the things associated with his name. St. Vitus Cathedral, begun in 1344. Charles University, the first in Central Europe, 1348. The spa town, Carlo Vivari, founded in 1349. The Charles Bridge, 1357. He built Karlstein Castle and others too, and he modernized and greatly expanded Prague with the addition of the new town. He even brought vines from France to Mjelnik, still now famous for its vineyards. The addition of the new town expanded Prague to three times its size. Charles filled it by inviting people from outside of Prague to live there tax-free. Most were Czech speakers, not German speakers, so this helped to revive the Czech language. People speak Czech today in part thanks to Charles IV. He also got the Pope's permission to have the Mass said in one church in Slavonic, the only such church in the Holy Roman Empire. Now Charles developed Prague as a means of consolidating power and putting the city on the map in an international way. Prague was the capital of the Holy Roman Empire during his tenure. He built churches, squares, and other buildings. In short, he did what Constantine had done. Charles made a new Rome in Prague through development projects and diplomatic marriages. Charles had four wives, only one at a time. Um, three had died before he got old. Uh, he relied on diplomacy and alliances to expand the kingdom, not military might. But Charles was also a legendary knight who loved to take part in tournaments, defying the advice of the Pope who thought it was undignified. Forensic investigations of his remains have now shed light on the injuries he suffered in a tournament in 1350, when his chin was fractured by a direct hit with a lance and he fell from his horse, resulting in a serious spinal injury. He withdrew for a time from the public, but he was eventually able to move again. However, he struggled to hide the changes in his appearance and he suffered for the rest of his life. Charles was extremely talented and had outshone all other European rulers of his time. He died in 1378 and was succeeded by his son, Václav IV. Uh, Charles' son from his fourth marriage, Sigismund, would also in time become the King of Hungary and Holy Roman Emperor. But he would occupy a far different place in Czech memory because it was he who promised the reformer priest Jan Hus safe conduct to Constance, where Hus was in fact imprisoned, tried, and burned at the stake in 1415. In the years that followed, Bohemia would be divided into two parties, those who were faithful to Rome and those who followed the teachings of Jan Hus, the Hussites. So our next stop will be with the leader of the Hussite party, Jerzy of Podjebrady. He was a non-dynastic king of Bohemia, and he ruled from 1458 to 1471. He was chosen by the estates to be the king, 
even gaining the support of some papal loyalists in spite of being on the site because his policies were moderate and tolerant. He was a peacemaker. His tolerance of the Hussites, though, drew the opposition of the Pope. The reason we're talking about Yerji of Podibradi today is that he tried to make peace with the Pope by suggesting one of the first visions of European unity, a framework of common institutions in which Christian powers would pledge to settle their differences peacefully. Now, despite strong diplomatic efforts, the idea never gained traction, and instead the Pope excommunicated and deposed him in 1466. He died five years later, never having abdicated the throne, though. Uh, lastly, I want to jump ahead to the 1500s and another dynasty, the House of Habsburg. The King of Bohemia and Holy Roman Emperor Rudolf II ruled from 1576 to 1612. He was born in Vienna, but he lived at the Spanish court from age 11 to 19. This gave him a cool, refined manner, typical of the Spanish court, but very unlike the court at Vienna. And for the remainder of his life, he was a quiet, secretive man who kept to himself and shunned both travel and the work of governance in favor of occult learning, that is astrology and alchemy, and his personal hobbies, horses, clocks, collecting rarities, and being a patron of the arts. He did suffer from depression, common in the Habsburg line, and it grew worse as he got older. Uh, this led him to withdraw even further into himself and his personal interests. Uh, Rudolf II came apart with his war on the Ottoman Empire. He wanted to unite Christendom with a crusade, and he waged war from 1593 to 1606. But his brother eventually had him taken prisoner and held in the Prague Castle until 1611, when Rudolf II ceded him the Bohemian crown. Rudolf II died unmarried in 1612, having retained only the title of Holy Roman Emperor, which his brother soon also gained. Six years later, in 1618, the Protestant Bohemians stood up for the rights the religiously tolerant Rudolf had previously granted them and tossed imperial Catholic governors out a window at the Prague Castle in what's known as the Defenestration of Prague. The men survived. Of course, whether you believe that they were carried softly to the ground by angels or that they escaped injury by landing in a pile of manure uh, might largely depend on your own affiliation. Either way, this was the start of the Thirty Years' War. Historians now see Rudolf's patronage of the arts and his other interests as an important part of the Renaissance, and they see his political failure as a genuine attempt to create a unified Christian empire. His, his successful influences are, are pretty impressive. Rudolf II collected paintings and commissioned works, and he had the most impressive collection in Europe at the time. He commissioned and collected mechanical devices, including scientific instruments, and scientific instrument makers were free and supported financially to develop instruments and techniques. He patronized natural philosophers, botanists, and astronomers. Tycho Brahe and Johannes Kepler were at his court and both worked on what was in fact the first table of data on the movement of the planets. That, that's another really good story. Um, Rudolf had a Kunstkammer, a, a cabinet of curiosities at Prague Castle. A lion and a tiger were said to roam freely there, which they have, actually have documentation for. They have records of payments to survivors of attacks and victims' families. Now, his collection of curiosities was unique because it was curated and arranged scientifically like an encyclopedia. It was a private collection, but artists and scholars were allowed to study it, and it became a priceless research tool in the later Age of Reason. As for Rudolf and the occult, Astrology and alchemy were mainstream science in Renaissance Prague. Rudolf adhered to both and even worked in a private laboratory. Nostradamus even dedicated a horoscope to him. Rudolf gave Prague the, the mystical reputation that's still strong and popular today. So here's the part where I transition into, into the show that you already saw, right? Uh, against the backdrop of these portraits, uh, we're going to present the knights uh, we've already enjoyed that. Um, and so I think I'll just say thank you. Um, that's all I have today.
strength that just to kind of supplement uh, the image, we made up a, a, a flow chart of uh, Bohemian Kings, and maybe on the way out or so you can take a look at it because way back there you don't you can't see it. But uh, it starts with about year two thousand, uh, one thousand, and it ends with two thousand on the other end, uh, and. The kings that uh, Ted talked about, they're all listed above on the upper part of the chart. And below are some reference points. So for example, just think about it. Columbus sails for America, right? 1492, it's right in the middle. So that's how far back the kings went. They, they, they started just before year 1000, and led to as far as, well, American independence, 1776. Uh, That's when uh, Maria Theresa and, and, and the uh, uh, Austria-Hungarian Empire kind of took, uh, took over the territory. But all in between, all these little marks are different kings. The ones that have a name to them are the ones that they talked about. So just the, the, the point I'm trying to make is that the history uh, speaks for itself. There were kings from year 1000 to year 2000, 1000 years of kings, and just for reference, just think about, we can, most of us can uh, relate to Columbus discovering America, and uh, the uh, uh, American uh, ind independence, we, you know, we think of that history. All through that period, in Bohemia, there were kings and knights that you saw, and uh, that was part of the history. So as you go out or so, you can take a look at it just to get a visual. Being an architect, I, I kind of see, I have to work visually, you know, I have to have pictures of things. Thank you all for coming.